Hi, welcome. Um, today we have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shannon Spaulding. Spaulding attended undergrad at Texas Tech University where she completed her BA in philosophy. Soon after, Spaulding moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas to, complete, to compete in track and field and pursue an MA in philosophy at the University of Arkansas. In the fall of 2005, she moved to Madison, Wisconsin to start working on a PhD in philosophy. Spaulding is now an assistant professor of philosophy at Oklahoma State University. Her general interests include the philosophy of mind, philosophical psychology, and the philosophy of science. The principal goal of her research is to construct a philosophically and empirically plausible account of social cognition. Um, she also has research interests in imagination, pretense, and action theory. In addition, she is also working on a co-edited special issue of the Philosophy of Science Journal Syntheses with our previous MCSI speaker, Kristen Andrews, and philosopher Evan Westra on the topic of folk psychology, pluralistic approaches. Today's discussion will focus on her recent book titled, How We Understand Others, The Philosophy and Social, Co Philosophy and Social Cognition. We would now like to welcome Shannon Spaulding. Hey, I'm told I'm not supposed to go past this line. So if I go past this line, give me some dirty looks. So I am interested in um, social cognition. That is the psychological and neural processes that underlie our ordinary interactions with other people. In particular, I'm interested in a certain kind of social cognition that's known as mind reading. Now, this is not the kind of thing that you see in fiction, like telepathy, sort of this magical connection to somebody else's mind. It's a much more quotidian sense of mind reading, that is just figuring out what people are thinking. Um, I'm interested in how we do that, that ordinary people figure out what other people are thinking. Um, so mind reading in this ordinary sense is just figuring out what somebody is feeling, and perhaps why they are feeling that, um, what their emotions are, what causes their emotions, what their intentions are, that is what they're trying to do, um, and what their beliefs are. So we will focus <laughs> a lot on people's beliefs in uh, today's talk. So in a lot of cases, and probably in most of these cases, it's really easy to figure out what people are thinking. So it's pretty easy to uh, figure out that this little girl is trying to grab a cookie, that she intends a cookie, intends to get a cookie, or wants a cookie. Um, uh, <laughs> there's all sorts of uh, mental states going on in, in this picture. Um, so in a sense, uh, mind reading is kind of comes really naturally to us, like most of us have. Um, pick up the, the hang of it around five or six years old, and we're pretty good at it. We get better at it as we go, but um, by mid-childhood, we're pretty good at mind reading. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's a, a, a complicated psychological task. You have to figure out what somebody is thinking or feeling or believing, and it's not like it's written on their face. They don't always tell you. You have to kind of your knowledge of what they're thinking and what they're doing and what they're uh, feeling is based on this kind of rich psychological inference about um, their behavior and about um, your culture and social norms. So it's not like a trivial task to figure out what other people are thinking. Um, so the mind reading literature in general tends to focus on how we figure out what other people believe now there's a somewhat, I guess, somewhat interesting historical story for why the mind reading literature tends to focus on uh, belief as much as it does. Uh, and I'll tell you that kind of historical story and then uh, give you um, some examples of how the mind reading literature focuses on belief um, so heavily. So back in the 70s and the early days of the literature on what's called folk psychology, which is you know just the uh, the psychology we have of other people, how ordinary people understand ordinary people, so folk psychology. There was this problem in figuring out whether chimpanzees really have the concept of belief or whether it just appears that they have the concept of belief. 
or whether children really have the concept of belief or it just appears that they have a concept. Because you could describe their behavior in ways that it looks like they have this sophisticated concept of belief. So to have the concept of belief, you have to understand that somebody has a belief about the way in which the world is. And that might not be the way the world really is. Um, and attributing beliefs to people is something that uh, we do quite a lot in our ordinary uh, social interactions. But there is this difficulty, a sort of problem of underdetermination. Like you couldn't tell from their behavior alone whether they really had the concept of belief, especially if they're not verbal, right? If they can't tell you, I have the concept of belief. Um, so Daniel Dennett, a philosopher uh, at Tufts University, was engaged in this literature, and he came up with this hypothetical experiment um, to test whether or not individuals will have the concept of belief. This is known as the false belief task. Um, so the basic idea is that if you can attribute to somebody a false belief, that is, if you can understand that an agent has a belief about the way the world is, they represent the world a certain way, and that's not the way the world really is. There's, in a sense, a dual representations, how the agent thinks it is and how the world actually is. If you can do that, that's sufficient evidence for attributing to you the concept of belief. Like that's, that's a pretty high bar, and if you can pass that task, then um, you thereby have the concept of belief. So a couple of psychologists were sort of following up on this hypothetical experiment that Dennett proposed with Joseph Perner and Ted Rothman, and they actually implemented this experiment and came up with uh, what's known as the Sally Ann task. This is just a version of the standard false belief task, and they um, gave this task to children. So it's uh, really pretty simple, and probably most of you will have no trouble with this. Um, but they have a couple puppets. Uh, there's Sally, and that's Anne. Sally has a basket. Anne has a box. Sally has a marble. She puts the marble into her basket, and Sally goes out for a walk. Anne takes the marble out of the basket and puts it into the box. Now Sally comes back, and she wants to play with her marble. Where will Sally look for her marble? So um, most of you will probably say that Sally's going to look into the basket for her marble. And if you're asked why, you'd say, well, that's because that's where she thinks it is. That's where she left it. She has a false belief about where the marble is. Uh, and if you can answer the question in that way, if you get the, the, in a sense, the correct answer that Sally's going to look into the basket, then you are attributing Sally, to Sally a false belief. And you have, you know, you're, that's good enough to uh, attribute to you the concept of belief. So this experiment was really foundational in the mind reading literature. It shaped a lot of what came afterwards. Um, so in addition to giving this task to children across cultures, um, it seems that uh, about age four, um, in pretty much every culture, children started to pass this task, whereas before age four, they systematically failed this task. Um, so this seemed to be something really important that they were um, learning or developing at around age four. Um, in addition to these findings, these uh, cross-cultural findings of this, uh, what seemed to be a developmental leap, um, there was uh, research on children with autism. It seems that uh, children with autism systematically fail this task even when they are matched uh, by chronological age or by verbal age or by mental age to children who are chronologically about four or five. So upwards of 10 or 11 for uh, their uh, mental or verbal age, they started to pass this task. But before this, they uh, failed that. Um, so this seemed to suggest that the false belief task was do it, it was tapping into something really important that neurotypical kids develop at around age four and that children with autism, it took a lot longer for them to develop um, this capacity to attribute uh, false belief and to um, have the concept of belief. So this shaped a lot of that literature. There was also this literature that came a lot in philosophy about how we attribute beliefs to other people. Um, so there's this uh, debate between what's known as the theory theory and the simulation theory. Um, and one thing they share in common is that they argue that we attribute beliefs to people all the time. This is something that's really a foundational part of our social interactions. But they disagree about how we do that. So the theory theory says, essentially, um, 
how we attribute beliefs to other people is a lot like a scientist attributes or posits an abstract theoretical entity. Right, you uh, observe the situation and you infer, I don't know how this actually works, a physicist can tell me, but like there's a little electron. Um, and on the basis of that, you make predictions about what's going to happen next. You don't actually see the electron, um, you just infer that there's an electron there, and that allows you to make predictions um, and explain various phenomena. According to the theory theory, this is kind of what's happening with social cognition. I don't actually see your beliefs, but I see your behavior and I infer that you believe X, Y, Z, and that allows me to predict your behavior and explain uh, other behavior that you might engage in. The simulation theory, in contrast, says that we don't need all of that um, uh, folk psychological information. We don't theorize. We're not positing uh, these unobservable entities. We really, in a sense, just sort of simulate you. We kind of put ourselves in your situation and figure out what we would think and feel and do in that situation and then just attribute that to you. Um, so they have a diff there's, there's a disagreement on the process of attributing beliefs, but the main thing they're trying to explain is how it is that we attribute beliefs to other people. Now there is also some discussion of how we attribute desires, but that plays a lesser role in uh, the literature. So even the literature, the philosophical and empirical literatures that critique the standard false belief task um, have still maintained the focus on belief. So one of the main critiques of the standard false belief task is that it tests for a lot more than just the concept of belief. So think about two and three year olds who have to try to take this task that I've just described to you. Not only do they have to listen to instructions from an adult who is not a parent, um, they have to follow the story, sort of the story that I described to you. They have to understand that the ball, or marble I guess, is in the box, it's not in the basket. They have to listen to the experimenter's question, um, and they have to inhibit a response to say where the ball actually is and give you an answer to a question that they might not have anticipated that you're going to ask, like where will Sally look for the ball? They have a kind of predisposition to help you find the ball, and that might be what they're having to suppress. So this is linguistically demanding, and it's a demanding on their executive control. So one critique of the standard false belief task is it's just too hard. It's not that children necessarily don't have the concept of belief, but you're testing for a lot more than the concept of belief here. And there seems to be some evidence that around two and a half, three, uh, neurotypical children are looking to the right answer. So in this case, the right answer would be um, the, the basket. That's where Sally um, thinks her, her toy is. Um, they'll look to the right place but give you the wrong answer. And so what some experimenters have done, so starting with um, Renee Bayerjan and Christine Onishi, was to come up with a nonverbal version of the false belief task. Um, it's one where you have infants as young as 10 months old watching an um, uh, experimenter with some toy and the toy. I don't have to go into the details. We can do that in the Q&A if you want. Um, watching a toy move back and forth and using looking time measures, that is to see how long infants look at various events. Um, they look to see whether infants look longer at some events, and if they look longer at those events, that suggests they're surprised. Um, and if they're surprised by certain events, that suggests they had a belief about how things were going to go, and it didn't actually go that way. So when the experimenter reaches into a box and saw the toy go into this box, that's surprising. And so one interpretation on this is that the infant is thinking, th this is all kind of over-intellectualized, but the infant is thinking like, you believe that the toy's over there, but you reached over here. So I'm confused by that. So this is a way in which even infants might be tracking um, false beliefs or tracking beliefs and might be said to possess the concept of belief. I don't really have like a, I always forget how this idiom goes, a horse in this race or a dog in this fight. Um, it's not a dog fight. No, it's, yeah, it is a dog fight. It's not a horse fight though, I know that. Um, <laughs> So I don't know how this all turns out. I'm really not sure. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that the overwhelming focus of all of this vast literature is how we attribute beliefs to other people. Um, and that is important. That does signify a very 
sophisticated development of our social cognitive abilities. But what I want to argue for the rest of this talk is that there's a lot more to understanding others than just belief attribution. Now, I take it that nobody would disagree with me on this. Um, everybody thinks there's a lot more to social cognition than just belief attribution, um, but this is just a particularly important part of our mind reading abilities. But what I'm going to argue is that the stuff that I'm going to be talking about um, shapes how we view mind reading more generally. So it's not just that um, in the real world, mind reading is messy. It's that it's messy in really important ways. So the input to mind reading, that is the stuff that we pay attention to, that varies person to person and demographic group to demographic group. It varies depending on the situation you happen to find yourself in. The process we use to mind read is going to vary depending on what your goals are in a social interaction. And what you do with these mind reading judgments is going to vary depending on the situation you find yourself in and your goals um, and various other uh, motivations. So it's that mind re the, the kind of overall thesis of the, the talk and of the book is that mind reading is just much messier and more complex and more philosophically interesting than you would guess just by reading some of the philosophical and empirical literature on mind reading. So uh, just to kind of sum up what I'm going to uh, do in the next few minutes, um, I'm going to argue that how we categorize people, how we socially categorize people, is really important to the mind reading we end up engaging in. Our goals that we have in a social interaction influence how we perceive that interaction. And um, the situational context we find ourselves in will shape that social interaction as well. So I'll talk first about social categorization. So social categorization is just dividing people and behaviors and events into categories. Um, this is essential for successful navigation of the world. So um, somebody might tell you to not judge a book by its cover. Um, that is unrealistic advice. We have to judge books by covers. Um, we have to sort people, behaviors, and events into social categories. It makes the world more easy to understand. It makes it more predictable. It makes it uh, easier for us to uh, influence for our own purposes. Um, so we do uh, sort people and behaviors and events into these very social categories. So the typical categories that we sort people into are age, race, and gender. Like these are in uh, heterogeneous society, um, some of the most salient social categories. Uh, we sort people into the categories age, race, and gender really fast, like 100, within 100 milliseconds we do this. So it's a, a, no math measure, but a tenth of a second. Um, and we do this even when we're under cognitive load, that is, even when we're busy with some other uh, task. We can sort of, in a sense, just glance at somebody and uh, know what their age, race, and gender roughly are. We sort them into categories. Um, on top of that, the social categories that we sort people into are associated implicitly with various characteristics. Um, so, for example, we tend to associate um, elderly with incompetence. Um, that is, we tend to think that somebody who is um, frail and elderly will be more likely to be incompetent than somebody who is not frail or elderly. We tend to associate being female with being warm. We tend to associate being baby-faced with being unthreatening. Um, and it, as it turns out, which we can talk about um, a lot more in the Q&A if you're interested in discussions of implicit bias, we also tend to associate being black with being violent, in particular male um, with being violent. These are associations that we make that are tested by things like priming task or the implicit association task. So probably some of you guys have heard about the implicit association task. You can go um, and take this test for yourself on the Harvard implicit uh, bias website. We can talk about the implicit association task and various uh, things associated with implicit bias if you guys are interested. My only point at this juncture is to highlight that we do automatically categorize people into various uh, social categories. 
often age, race, and gender, but others too, depending on what's salient in the context. So it might be religion, it might be your sports team affiliation, it might be the sorority that you're in. Um, it could be all sorts of things given what's salient in the situation. Um, it's just that age, race, and gender tend to be um, always salient in societies like ours. On top of the associations that, um, or the, the features that are associated implicitly with these social categories, we also spontaneously make personality trait inferences. And again, we do this very quickly. So the, the timeline for this is kind of up for um, empirical debate, but it's somewhere between a tenth of a second and a second. We will infer that somebody is, for example, dominant or aggressive, or somebody is trustworthy, um, or somebody is intelligent or friendly. And we make these trait inferences really fast. And of course, these could be mistaken, right? Somebody could just seem friendly, or somebody could just seem dominant. Um, in fact, they, they aren't. Um, but although we do make these fast and these could be wrong, there also is evidence that first impressions have a way of sticking around. So even when you're given more time, like several minutes, to infer somebody's personality trait, it's usually the, the kind of split judgment that you make at the beginning that sticks. We, we often don't change our mind even when we have more time to think about it. Okay. So this is sort of social categorization. We do this we, before we even get to the mind reading process. We sort people and behavior and events into these social categories, and they're associated with various features implicitly and um, automatically. And we make these uh, personality trait inferences before we even get to the process of mind reading. And of course, as I'm going to argue later, that's going to influence the mental states you end up attributing to somebody. So if you infer that somebody is aggressive, for example, um, that's going to really shape how you view that behavior and the, the mental state inferences you're going to make, um, as opposed to viewing somebody as, you know, if the, if somebody telling a joke, for example. I mean, this could be viewed aggressively if it's, you know, uh, looks like a hostile interaction, or in a different context altogether, like in a bar, a crowded bar where it's loud, you might view this as just, you know, funny, raucous behavior or something. Um, that's going to really influence how you end up mind reading the uh, agents in that social interaction. On top of all that, so this is, I'm going to finish this one chunk of, of the empirical data. On top of all that, um, uh, we also divide people into in-groups and out-groups. Um, so when we divide people into in-groups and out-groups, all this means is that um, you perceive somebody to be similar to you. Um, and perceived similarity is, of course, relative to a context. Um, in some context, somebody might be similar to me, whereas they're not in another context. So when hobbies are salient, um, it's the runners who are in my in-group, and all of you non-runners are in the out-group. Um, when family life is um, salient, there might be runners who do not have children, so they're part of the out-group. Right? So in one context, the runners are the in-group, and in another context, uh, people with children are uh, part of the in-group. So in-grouping and out-grouping is um, relative to um, certain context. So on top of the fact that we uh, divide people into in-groups and out-groups, we also tend to prefer people who are part of our in-group. And this happens for the kind of typical in-grouping, out-grouping divides, like nationality, religion, age, race, and gender. Um, but it also occurs for minimal groups as well. So today we wear the red shirts and you wear the blue shirts. Um, I prefer the people I have sort of just this arbitrary grouping. I prefer the people who have red shirts on today as opposed to the, to the blue shirts. Or you guys have probably all heard of that experiment from the, who knows, the 1950s or 60s where there's the, the blue-eyed kids and the, the brown-eyed kids. and. Um, they, they got these children who I think were about five or six years old to display some sort of surprisingly um, hostile behavior to kids who were sort of just arbitrarily grouped into this um, brown eyed group or the, the blue eyed group. Um, so we display this in group favoritism and out group bias increasingly when there is a threat to one's well being or to one's identity or a perceived threat anyway and a competition for resources. So this tendency to prefer your own in-group and to um, um, sort of display bias towards the out-group is exaggerated when there is competition or threat, or perceived competition or threat, anyhow. At the extreme, we seem to dehumanize those who are, are we perceive to be least like us. So um, 
drug addicts or the homeless, we uh, tend to think of them as unfeeling brutes or unthinking automata. Um, I'm of course not endorsing any of these things, I'm just <laughs> describing the, the, the fact that we tend to do these things. Um, um, we as uh, uh, an American culture and probably um, more generally in Western cultures tend to do these things. Um, Okay, so kind of putting together the social categorization unit that I've just finished describing, um, even before we get to the process of mind reading, there's all this really interesting um, and uh, complicated stuff going on that influences what we pay attention to. Like the situational context that we happen to find ourselves in is going to prime certain interpretations and it's going to make us key into certain features of individuals that mark them as either part of the in-group or part of the out-group. And those features are going to be associated implicitly with various characteristics. And that's going to influence how we interpret their behavior in terms of their personality trait inferences. All of this comes way before mind reading even happens. It's, in a sense, the input to mind reading. And so you can see already, like before we even get to uh, mind reading attributions, there's just a lot of really messy, complicated stuff um, that makes the mind reading picture um, even more complicated than um, things like the false belief task would indicate. So on top of social categorization, um, we don't always, so if you read the mind reading literature, you might come away with the idea that we're always trying to get it right. Like when I'm mind reading somebody, I'm trying to figure out what exactly they believe. Um, and it matters that I get it right. And that is the case sometimes. Uh, but accuracy is not always our most important priority in a social interaction. Sometimes. Um, we're more motivated by just getting a good enough explanation on the table or some motivated by efficiency, I'll say. Um, sometimes we're motivated by um, preserving our own identity or our own um, uh, self-image. What we're motivated by are, are like self-interested goals. So sometimes we really want to get it right. Sometimes we want to get it good enough. And sometimes we want something altogether different. And corresponding to each of these different kinds of goals are different strategies for engaging in a social interaction. So when accuracy is the most important goal, um, what we do is we search for relevant information carefully in a deliberative fashion. So um, if I'm on um, a job search committee and I'm going to interview some candidates, um, and so I I live and uh, work in Oklahoma, a small town in Oklahoma. Um, I, really, I want friends and I want my friends to stay. Uh, so I'm going to like think really hard about the interviews and the questions to ask them and think like, you know, are they going to be happy here in small town Oklahoma? Are they going to stay here? Are they going to leave at the drop of a hat? Are they going to be annoyed with Oklahoma students um, and their ridiculous accents? Um, I, like, I'm thinking like carefully about these things. Um, thinking about what their mindsets are. So in that case, it matters to me uh, personally um, that I get it right. So I engage in this sort of careful search for information. This is hard to do if you're already under cognitive load. So if you are um, on this job search committee, um, but you're like multitasking, like you're really busy or you're stressed out or you're thinking about your sick child, um, it's really hard to engage in this process in a systematic way or if you are just not practiced at this type of reasoning. So when we have a, a different sort of goal, when efficiency is a primary goal and accuracy is only a secondary goal, we engage in different sorts of mind reading uh, processes. So in these cases, when we're unmotivated or unable to engage in a thorough search, especially when we're in very familiar situations where we feel like we don't have to invest a lot of time into figuring out what's going on, we engage in different kinds of shortcuts depending on whether the person we're mind reading is part of the in-group or part of the out-group. So when the person is part of the in-group, the shortcut we take is just to project our own thoughts onto them. They don't have to think very hard about what you're thinking. I think like, well, you're more or less like me in some relevant respects, and so I just project what I'm thinking onto you. Like you probably think the same thing about uh, this situation that I do. Um, when the person is part of an out group, we don't project, we stereotype. And I mean this in a, a kind of a neutral way. So stereotypes can be positive, negative, or neutral beliefs about some social group. 
Um, you just use the beliefs about a social group and then just um, attribute that. Now this can go awry in lots of ways, right? So you might um, inappropriately think that somebody is similar to you. In fact, they're really different from you. This is the, the false consensus effect. I think um, sometimes freshman students get this experience when they uh, come from a homogenous uh, high school or, or hometown, and then they come to college and they think uh, everybody thinks the way that they do, and then they talk up in class and people have really different sorts of beliefs. It's just surprising to them. Um, so this is uh, the false consensus effect. Um, you think that people believe what, what you believe. This can also go awry when you think that somebody is really different from you, and in fact they're actually pretty similar to you. Like they're just superficially different from you. Um, and in that case, you use a stereotype when something like projection would be more appropriate. Now, I, so we can't avoid using these shortcuts, right? There, we just do not have the cognitive capacity to engage in careful deliberation in all circumstances. That, I mean, when you're in the grocery store and you're just trying to get the attention of the um, the self-checkout attendant because you don't want to talk to somebody. You just you know need to get his attention and that's it. Like you're not going to engage in this careful, deliberative process about what the the checkout attendant really uh, believes about the world. Um, it's just going to be these sh shortcuts. So we have to rely on these shortcuts. They're really um, useful, and it would be uh, very difficult to navigate social interactions without these uh, shortcuts. So the previous two strategies or uh, approaches to mind reading differ with respect to how effortful they are. So careful deliberation is very effortful and um, the shortcuts I've described are, are not. When we are motivated by our own self-interest, the strategies that we adopt can be effortful or um, efficient. Right? So that's not the, the distinction. We can um, have self-interested biases influencing both deliberative processes and the shortcuts. So I'll describe a few different um, shortcuts to you guys, or sorry, uh, a few different um, biases that are very common in our reasoning about other people. So the first is what's known as the group serving attributional bias. And it's easiest to explain this um, by starting with the self-serving attributional bias. So Here's just an example. So an important part of my job is writing articles and sending them out for peer review and getting them rejected and then getting harsh feedback and then sending them back out and then getting them rejected again and then sending them back out and then eventually getting them accepted. So part of what you tell yourself when you get these rejections is like, ah, the reviewers just didn't get it. Right. They didn't understand what I was trying to say, right? Um, it's not that um, I had it wrong, it's just that they're, um, you know, whatever. It's just not landing in the right laps. It's not landing, uh, you know, there's a, a cranky reviewer. It's, you know, known as reviewer number two. Um, but when the paper gets accepted, you don't do that same thing, right? Like, it wasn't luck that you landed with that right reviewer, right? You say, like, ha, finally, they finally got the, um, the wisdom of this paper. They figured it out. So there's a different pattern of explanation when you fail and when you succeed. Like when you fail, it's an external thing, right? It's not something sort of internal to you. It's not that you're not smart enough or you're not good enough. Um, typically, when we succeed, uh, or at least when there's a sort of healthy psychological functioning, uh, when we succeed, we think like, okay, see, here's the real me coming out. Now, the part that's relevant here for mind reading is that we do this with in-groups and out-groups too. So um, I think a sports analogy works really well. So um, when my team wins, it's because my team is great. Right? They're a hardworking blue collar team and you know, it's um, you know, about time that they, they won and they deserved it because they worked really hard for it. But when my team loses, that is your team wins, it's because there was just a few crucial plays where the refs could have called it one way or the other, but the refs called it that way and it went against them. Right. Your team wins because your team got lucky in the right ways. So the, the point to notice here is that there's different things that you're keying on to when your in-group wins and when your in-group loses. 
So when your in-group wins, they succeed, you're looking at like internal um, sort of mental phenomena. You say like, well, it's because they're smart, it's because has um, some kind of like virtues that they possess. But if the other team wins, you don't think that way, right? You think it's like some external thing, like some situational explanation. So you have different patterns of explanation, um, internal, external patterns of uh, explanation, depending on whether the in-group wins or the out-group wins. Um, and even though I know about this bias, I cannot help but succumb to it. Every time I watch uh, the Wisconsin Badgers play, every single time, like they even have these, now you can, uh, like, and I think it's like the, the Sweet 16, like you can watch your team, like your team's channel. Um, there's like a, a, the, the, the home team and the away team or the, uh, the Badgers versus uh, the Buckeyes. And you can watch broadcasters who are like Badgers, like talking, um, broadcasting the, the event. Um, and say, oh, we got robbed, um, which just makes this uh, bias even harder to avoid. Another bias that is uh, really difficult to avoid is what's known as naive realism. This one I feel is even uh, stickier. Um, naive realism is the tendency to regard people, especially people who disagree with you, as biased by their own personal motivations or um, by the news that they consume um, or the situation they happen to find themselves in, whereas you regard yourself as simply seeing things how they really are. And so it's called naive realism. Um, this is a, the, the, the psychological term. There's a philosophical uh, view that's really different. And it's called naive realism because you think, like, I just see things how they really are. Um, I'm not subject to bias. Whereas, of course, we are all subject to our own uh, idiosyncratic uh, biases. Um, this, of course, is going to influence um, how we mind read others, especially those who disagree with us. Right? We won't take their... Um, uh, behavior seriously or we won't interpret it at face value. We think they're um, biased, whereas we see things um, as they are. So finally, the last um, uh, bias that I'll describe to you is probably the stickiest of them all. And confirmation bias is our tendency to consider only information that confirms our preconceived ideas. Um, and to interpret ambiguous information in light of those preconceived ideas. So confirmation bias is really hard to avoid, um, to, in a sense, written into your perception of the world. Um, you attend to information that confirms what you think. So this, all the information you're getting is that you were right. Now, of course, facts do matter. Sometimes the situation is just obvious, and it's obvious that you got it wrong. The difficulty with social interactions is that um, social interactions aren't that way. They're, you interpret a social interaction. And it's not like you know, somebody has given you a scientific paper on what that person um, is thinking or feeling um, or uh, intending. Right? So social interactions often are ambiguous. Like You don't know what somebody else is thinking, so you have to interpret it. So we're really... Um, subject to confirmation bias in these uh, situations. Okay, so what I want to do now is just put all of this together, um, the, the three different uh, chunks of, or, yeah, the three different chunks of uh, data that I'll describe to you uh, and what it looks like for a broader conception of mind reading. Okay, so at the input level, that is the things that you're paying attention to that influence mind reading, um, the situational context that you happen to find yourself in influences the interpretive schema that are available to you. Right? So if you are um, in one situation, say you're on uh, in a, oh, I don't know, um, on a bus, for example, where people tend to um, kind of keep to themselves and not make um, small talk with other people, a certain behavior might be seen as like intrusive, like you know, we on the in the social interaction we're kind of keeping to ourselves and we're not talking to other people. But that same social interaction in say a bar at midnight might not be seen as intrusive at all. It might just be seen as friendly. So the situation you happen to find yourself in is going to prime certain schema. The categories that we employ and the associations that they or the features that they are associated with also influence how we interpret the social interaction. 
And whether or not we are mind reading somebody who is part of the in-group or the out-group and the personality traits we infer, these are all factors that influence the input to mind reading. That is before we even get to the stage of mind reading. Our goals in a social interaction influence the process of mind reading that we employ. So it could be deliberative, it could be a shortcut like projection or stereotyping, um, or it could be self-interest distorting either deliberative or um, efficient mind reading. And I didn't talk as much about this, but I'll sort of briefly talk about this now. In the mind reading literature, it seems that the only thing you do with um, a mental state inference is predict behavior or explain behavior. Um, but that's definitely not the case. We do lots of things with um, our mental state inferences. Um, so one thing we do is what's known as uh, mind shaping. So Tad Zawitzki has a, a book called Mind Shaping. Um, and his basic idea is that sometimes we're not trying to figure out what somebody believes, we're trying to make them believe that. And in a sense, we're trying to sort of shape them or regulate them into having certain sorts of mental states so that um, they fit within our social norms. So we do this all the time with children. Um, we try to get them to be more predictable by reminding them that they like this or they want this. Um, this is a, a mind shaping process. Um, on top of that, we also are engaged in social regulation, like we're trying to get people to behave in certain sorts of ways. So Victoria McGeer has um, some work on regulative folk psychology. So she thinks that one of the important functions of folk psychology or mind reading is to regulate our social interactions in a, a similar way to uh, Tad Zawitzki's uh, mind shaping. And finally, sometimes we're just moralizing. Sometimes we're social, socially signaling our view about something to either in-groups or, or out-groups. Um, so it's not the case that we're always just trying to predict and explain behavior. Okay, so this is my view. This is mind reading. It's complicated. It's messy. This is how I think it um, often is in the real world. Um, this is a kind of uh, mixture of social psychology and cognitive psychology and philosophy. So we're putting all of these together to come up with this complicated view of how mind reading works. What I'm going to do over the next few minutes is just draw out some of the epistemic and ethical implications of um, this more nuanced and um, broader view of mind reading that I've drawn out here. Okay, um, I'll move pretty quickly through this just because we're, we're nearing the end of our, our clock here, um, but we can talk much more about this in the Q&A if you want. So there's this literature in philosophy on peer disagreement. Um, so this is the epistemology of peer disagreement. And the question is, um, when somebody who you take to be an epistemic peer disagrees with you, what do you do? So what's an epistemic peer? It's somebody who has more or less the same knowledge as you, they are more or less rational to you as you are, um, they're well-meaning, but they disagree with you. So the kind of standard example um, given in the literature is that you go to dinner with your friend and your friend seems to be just as good at math as you are, um, and your friend uh, seems to be just as, um, uh, reasonable as you are, and you are deciding to split the check, and uh, you come up with different estimates of how to split the check, like what, what uh, each of you owes. What do you do in that case? Do you um, conciliate? Do you say, like, well, I must be wrong. Um, you know, you are just as good at this as I am, and you disagree with me, so um, probably you're right. Or do you remain steadfast? Do you say, like, no, you know, I am just as good at this as you are, so um, probably I'm right in this case. Um, the math example is sort of just a, a silly toy example, right? This could be the case for something um, more complicated about, you know, um, politics or religion. You know, somebody who is uh, just as reasonable and intelligent as I am um, believes in God or doesn't believe in God. Like, how do you, um, what's the, the, the situation there? Do I sort of maintain that I'm right or do I think like, well, maybe this person is right? What do you do in those situations? Uh, and there's a, a healthy literature debating whether you ought to conciliate or remain steadfast. Um, applying the broader conception of mind reading that I've been laying out here, there's a more fundamental question at play, and that is how do we decide who's an epistemic inferior, or who's an epistemic peer, or an epistemic superior? The 
data that I've laid out suggests that there's a really complicated story for this, and we are not particularly good at figuring out who actually is an epistemic peer. So I'll give you just a little taste of, of the, the kind of data that I'm thinking of. Um, this is from some work by uh, Susan Fisk and uh, Anne Cuddy. Um, we tend to have these two different dimensions for thinking of uh, people. Um, we can think of people in terms of how competent they are. So somebody can be like um, highly competent or not highly competent. Um, we also think of people in terms of how warm and kind they are. So somebody can be um, high in warmth or low in warmth. And corresponding to these different combinations are various emotions we have to people that we regard as sort of high in warmth and high in competence or low in warmth and low in competence. So for example, people who we regard to be um, high in warmth but low in competence, we regard with pity. So they are not very competent, but they are uh, likable. Somebody we regard to be as low or yeah, low in um, warmth, but high in competence, we regard with envy. Uh, people that we regard as high in warmth and high in competence, we regard with admiration. And um, we regard people who are uh, low in warmth and low in competence as contempt. So you can see, I mean, you can fill these out for yourselves, examples that you um, uh, might have, but uh, people like drug addicts or uh, the homeless would belong in this uh, lower corner uh, that here. Now, the stuff that I was talking about with the uh, social categories that are salient to us and the features that are implicitly associated with these and the personality traits that we associate with these are how you populate this graph. Right, so we tend to think, for example, that um, elderly, frail people are low in competence, but if it's you know, a woman, we would regard her as being warm and friendly. So she would go up into the upper left-hand corner right there. Um, associated with these emotions are also different kinds of behaviors that we engage in. So I'll just uh, give you a couple examples. I don't read the whole chart. But so somebody who is high in warmth but low in competence, we would um, actively help that person. But somebody who is low in warmth um, and high or sort of um, midline in competence, we would um, actively either not help them or harm that person. So different behaviors that are corresponding to these various emotions. So if you add in all of the stuff that I was talking about earlier in the talk to this kind of uh, empirical data, that should make you really skeptical that we are reliable at estimating who is an epistemic peer. So it's likely that somebody who is part of a marginalized, stigmatized group, if we regard them as an epistemic peer, just given how all of these features work together, it's likely that they're actually an epistemic superior. So in that case, when you take this person who you regard as an epistemic peer to have disagreed with you, you shouldn't remain steadfast. You ought to really conciliate. So and, I mean, this is going to differ case by case depending on um, who's involved in this. But I think we should be really skeptical of our ability to reliably estimate who's a peer and who's an inferior and who's uh, superior in this case. So this is just one of the um, implications of um, my broader conception of mind reading and how it influences some work in epistemology. I'll talk briefly about um, some work on epistemic injustice and the um, way in which I think the literature on epistemic injustice is sensitive to the empirical data that I've described. So epistemic injustice is the tendency of a, or a certain kind of epistemic injustice, testimonial injustice, is the tendency of a hearer, so you guys, you guys are hearers, um, to downgrade the credibility of a speaker just because of the hearer's prejudices. So that is, I'm downgrading your credibility, not because of anything you say, but it's because, in a sense, my stereotypes or associations about you. So I won't take you as seriously. So there's a lot of literature on this in medical um, ethics. So um, there's findings that doctors will take uh, certain sorts of patients' expressions of pain less seriously. They might not think that they're really in pain. They might think that they're faking it. They might think they're trying to get um, pain drugs. Um, whereas somebody from a different demographic group, they might not do that same thing. 
Right? This is a, a case of um, epistemic injustice. So the literature on epistemic injustice is sensitive to all of the empirical data that I've been describing here. Um, but I think that the interventions that they suggest, in particular the interventions suggested by Miranda Fricker and Jose Medina, um, really are unhelpful. So I'll just quickly um, describe the sorts of things that they talk about on how to combat epistemic injustice. So one thing they suggest that you should do is you should kind of look in a sense, like turn inward and try to figure out whether or not you are biased in certain situations. So self-monitor for bias. Um, you should train yourself to avoid bias. Um, so in, in the situations that you'll be biased, you should just practice not being biased. You should cultivate the virtue of epistemic injustice as opposed to the vice of epistemic injustice. The reason why I think these are unhelpful uh, has to do with the section I presented to you on self-interested biases. We have a very strong tendency to regard ourselves as unbiased. Right? This is the naive realism bias. Right? Um, we don't think of ourselves as biased. It has to be a really obvious case for us to say like, oh, wow, okay, so that was, um, that was a case of me being biased. So this is, in a sense, the low-hanging fruit. You'll notice, maybe, the, maybe you'll notice the obvious cases. But what you won't notice is the systematic patterns of bias. You won't see those in part because of naive realism, the tendency to regard others who disagree with you as bias and to regard yourself as seeing things how they really are, but also because of confirmation bias, because everything you're attending to is confirming what you believe. You're not attending to the things that disconfirm what you believe. And if you're just relying on yourself to monitor yourself, you're not going to notice these things. So I think uh, not only are these not helpful interventions, they might actually be harmful interventions because if you engage in this process and you think like, okay, I've done my due diligence, you're less likely to try even harder to find cases of bias in your own case. You might think like, well, I've, I've, done, my, I've done my work here. Like I'm, I'm not biased. And you will be overly confident in your... Um, um, apparent lack of uh, bias. So I think the more promising interventions uh, are not going to solve the problem of epistemic injustice, but they will uh, perhaps take a bite into these things. And they have to do with educating and using your social world to, um, in a sense, set up um, um, a scaffolding so that uh, you don't have to police yourself, the world, in fact, uh, can uh, help you avoid bias. You can set up various institutional measures. So just very briefly, I think what you need to do is not try to figure out what your own biases are. That's really difficult to do, and you're probably not going to do it very well. Um, so you should learn about the biases that are common in your groups, like your professional group or your demographic groups. You should have meaningful interactions with out-group members. You should learn uh, about their experiences in ways that are not tokenizing. That is probably very difficult to do. Um, and understand the situations that are likely to evoke biases and form what are called uh, implementation, implementation intentions. So you know that when you're grading, for example, you're trying to grade as fast as possible because you don't want to spend any more time than um, is necessary to grade these papers. Um, and you might sort of say like, well, if I um, read such and such a topic, I'm going to um, have this sort of response to it. Um, this is just a sort of uh, silly example, but it might be the case that like um, you get really annoyed with certain topics that your students write about, or you get really annoyed with um, since the dawn of time, right, the, the way in which students sometimes uh, start a paper, um, right, you might say to yourself, like, I'm not going to, um, like, take that seriously. I'm going to sort of set that aside and, and not uh, uh, worry so much about the terrible spelling in this paper or, or what have you. Um, that's only part of the story. That's only going to get you so far is educating yourself on these things. Um, the other part of the story is to shape your social environment, that is to make your uh, social environment more diverse. Um, we learn the associations that I described from our social environments. We pick them up um, pretty seamlessly from the interactions that we engage in as children. So it stands to reason that if you don't like the associations you have, 
you need to change your social interactions. You need to change your social environment to uh, one that uh, where your peers and your friends and the things that you are, uh, or the, the, the news that you're reading is more along the lines of uh, the social environment that you want to have. You ought to exploit structural and institutional measures. So for grading, you should, um, probably most of your students in here, but um, there ought to be anonymous grading so that you're not um, biased by who the student is. You know, this is a student that I really like, and I know that they, you know, this is sort of a messy paper, but I know they have it really in them, or this is a student I don't really like, or the student doesn't come to class. If you anonymize these things, then you don't have these associations with that. Um, the same is true for uh, job searches and anonymizing resumes. Um, and finally, I think uh, one of the things that's really important is to have open conversations with other people about the possibility of bias. Um, because if you have other people who are openly checking you for the possibility of bias, that's much more likely to be successful than just monitoring yourself for the possibility of bias. So for those of the students who actually uh, read the book, you'll know that I don't think that these are a silver bullet. Um, probably nothing is going to eliminate uh, biases, uh, uh, epistemic or uh, ethical biases. Um, but these are a better way to go than um, just simply policing yourself. Okay, so I will stop there. Thank you.